Welcome to One on One. Today, my guest is a globally renowned advocate for human rights and good governance, as well as a leading scholar on police and criminal justice reform in West Africa. He is the founder of the Clean Foundation, a civil society group that promotes public safety, security, and accessible justice in West Africa. Also, he has also held various posts with the Civil Liberties Organization, otherwise known as a CLO, one of Nigeria's first human rights organizations. He is the CEO and Chair of the Altus Alliance, which is a global network of non-profits, and also a member of the International Society for Criminology. He's a member of the boards of many non-profits and initiatives against crime and violence around the world. This includes the International Center for the Prevention of Crime, African Police and Civilian Oversight Forum, Open Society Global Criminal Justice Fund, and a member of the African Advisory Council of Human Rights Watch. And he is also the regional director, West African region for Ford Foundation. He is Innocent Chukuma. Thank Good you. to have you. Happy to be here. That's a big, big profile. <laughs> Don't be and deceived by it. <laughs> <laughs> I am not deceived. I know, I know it is what it is. <laughs> All right. Good to have you uh, here this morning. Now, we want to look at your work in social in activism uh, we know that you are a strong advocate for that uh, i mean your profile explained that as one who has been in the struggle and in the fight you know uh, for social justice for a system that works what point would you say at what point did you start off or recognize yourself as an activist i would say it dates back to my days in the secondary school, precisely um, when I was in the final year, I think it was in 1983, I was a, a house captain, a house prefect, depending on what uh, it's called uh, now. students these days call it, uh, uh, in Holy Ghost College, Umwaiha. And uh, it will be surprising to students of today to actually know that there was a time when schools were properly run hmm. and that the remit of a house captain or house prefect is actually to go and inspect the type of food students eat, wow. the type of places they are housed and make reports about how to improve them. Mm -hmm. And it so happened on this particular day that uh, we were inspecting a lunch for, for, for students and they had prepared uh, beans and yam for, mm -hmm. for students. Those days we used to have food contractors that, uh, you know, uh, prepares food for, for the students. So before the, the food is served, uh, the house captains, a team will go and um, look at them. And we had warned these particular contractors mm -hmm. on two previous occasions not to cook um, beans that were uh, spoiled or yams that were rotting. And this particular day, they, we observed that the, 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 the yams were rotting and we refused to uh, eat it and mm. decided to carry them and pour them in the house of the, uh, of the principal of the school. Really? Which led to uh, our suspension from school and we were asked to go and, uh, you know, uh, uh, bring our parents. Mm -hmm. And I had to go and, uh, and, and, and bring my, my, my father. I have told this uh, story several times mm -hmm. when I approached him and told him that they, had, they wanted him to come. Mm -hmm. And then he read out the three riot acts <laughs> that, uh, you know, is the cardinal sins, which if I had committed, he would not follow me anywhere. Mm -hmm. One is, did you cheat in exam? Uh, did you steal? Did you pregnant a girl? Mm -hmm. And I did none of such. And he said, we should go. So we went to, uh, to, to the school, the panel, they set up to investigate this. I was kept in the altar room, and he was with them um, in, in the in the meeting room. And suddenly, I started, uh, you know, hearing uh, raised voices, and mm -hmm. he stormed out of the room and uh, said, "We should uh, uh, go." And uh, as we're going, he told me what happened. That uh, you know, they 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 say that that we why we were suspended was that they didn't cook good food for us. Mm -hmm. And he asked them, didn't he pay the boarding fees and school fees? Why didn't they cook uh, the right you know, food? You know, so. We went home and then we started discussing because I didn't think he would support me. All this while I was, uh, you know, sitting and standing with trepidation that he was going to come out and, uh, and scold me uh, and all of that, but he didn't. So he gave me my first uh, lesson in leadership, uh, which is that, uh, yes, what we did 
uh, was right. We should stand up for our right, but right, every right has a consequence. And then, uh, because I, having been expelled, because the, com the culmination of that panel was that I was uh, expelled from dormitory. But mm. because I had registered for WAEC, they couldn't stop me from attending lessons for WAEC. So I had to commute from home, and he bought me a, a bicycle that I use uh, in doing it. So that strengthened me and made me realize that what I was doing, that I thought was being uh, strong headed and being. Mm. Uh, uh, if you like, uh, uh, a misguided student was actually something constructive. And mm -hmm. I, I, I took it from there awesome. in university and uh, elsewhere. And then in university, again, I was uh, expelled, which uh, <laughs> we'll get into. <laughs> uh, all right. So, uh, so in spite of that, um, mm -hmm. for you, it was a sign that you were headed in the right direction. Now, talking about civil, civil uh, liberties organization in mm -hmm. Nigeria, in your assessment, uh, yeah. how do you look at it these days in terms of your own activities in the past and as at now, where are we? I would say two things. Um, one is that we have made some progress if you look at the, the level of rights violations under the military, um, which we all grew as youngsters. And now um, we don't have the kind of rapacious violations involving activists. Uh, political activists, especially as we used to have uh, a military days. So though today there are a few people who are arrested, but those days, if you are uh, an activist, you know that it's a regular routine that you would be uh, picked up. But having said that, that the, 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 the level is reduced for political activists. For ordinary criminal suspects, I mm -hmm. mean, if you're arrested on the streets or all kinds of substitutions that can be trumped up, the situation has not changed because the same method of uh, police investigation, which mm -hmm. is essentially uh, asking you to confess uh, whatever you are accused of. And if you say you did not commit the crime, they do all kinds of things to you, including torture to make you to confess. Mm -hmm. It has lingered uh, uh, till today. That's one level. Then the other one is that activists, uh, those who are championing redress of these uh, uh, violations and pushing the frontiers of uh, human rights. I would say today we are not, uh, they are not doing it with the kind of vigor that uh, you know, we used during our days. Maybe because those days we were faced with a very uh, brutal military dictatorship. Today, people stroll into uh, activism work on the basis of uh, I beg, what I call I beg to apply. You, know, you look around, there's no job. Oh, this uh, group advertised for the role of a program officer or a project officer, you apply. But those days, you, had, you actually had a pipeline mm. for uh, leadership renewal in the uh, social sector, which is it started with the student movement. As you are graduating from university, you mm -hmm. know what you want to do with your life. So it's not a question of, oh, there's job here, there's job. Many of us have turned down lucrative jobs, in quote, to you know, go the direction we go because we are prepared for that from the student movement. Unfortunately, the student movement is no longer there today. Mm -hmm. All right, having said that, um, let's look at uh, Nigeria's uh, democratic space. Um, Nigeria prides itself as a democratic nation, um, but again, we've seen issues in the past that may not exactly suggest that. Let's talk about elections, for instance. Now, in, our, in your own assessment, how would you rate us in terms of election as a democratic nation? And you know, what's the level of engagement and participation of the people? If you had asked me this question in 2015, after the, uh, the March general election, I would have been very optimistic, very mm. uh, effusive uh, in telling you that we have made progress if we look at the quality of elections from 1999 when the Fourth Republic began to 2015 when we achieved the first inter-party alternation of power. So it looked as if we are making progress. But after the 20... 19 uh, elections and what happened in various states have become very disillusioned. Mm. Um, and uh, it's almost like uh, we have come to the end of a uh, hope that somehow we could wobble and fumble ourselves into societal transformation without, without being very deliberate and engaged and holding those who run elections and are participants in elections accountable to keeping to the standard. So mm -hmm. I'm not as hopeful as uh, I used to be, but I'm in the business of marketing hope. I'm in the business of uh, selling enthusiasm. I can't uh, afford to be despondent, but there's a lot to do. And uh, 
we really, really need to step up our as various uh, role players in the electoral process if we indeed want to build a democratic society because mm. what we still have now is what you might call at best elected civilian government. Mm. All right. Um, before we, we I come back to something you mentioned mm. earlier, mm. but I want to quickly ask you, right, um, the activism of this day is of course different from the one in, the, in the time past. Um, so many people have also argued that activists, without you know, uh, trying to talk down their role, uh, these days are just easy going people. It looks like you can be an activist on social media. How do you respond to that? Is there a connection between being an activist on social media and being a real human activist, so to speak? Yeah, there, there, there's been a lot of talk about the, the virtual space and the real space. In the virtual space, you can sit in your house and throw stones uh, in the marketplace, regardless of who it falls on. And when you throw that stone or you make a comment, uh, however I say big uh, it is, and you get a few likes, you think you have contributed. Uh, whereas the, it needed to be completed, uh, complemented by engaging in the real space. And then on the other extreme, those who have become veterans of the real space, mm -hmm. uh, you know, who are a product of uh, that era of organizing in the public space, mobilizing people, are also uh, not uh, adept at using the virtual space. So, which means the, the challenge now is how do you merge? Right. How do you synchronize uh, what is happening in the virtual space and the real space? How do you move people to uh, you know, get up from their couches where mm -hmm they sit with the internet connections and post or two, actually go to the street. Mm -hmm. And how do you also get those who are always on the street to realize that strategic communication, using social media to engage people, getting more eyeball to issues you believe in, mm -hmm. adds to the struggle. So I'm not going to uh, get into that dichotomy, oh, this one is doing better than this, but the two need to really, really mm -hmm. merge and mesh to, for us to achieve There must progress. be synergy somewhere. Precisely. All yeah. right, uh, we will take a quick break, and when we, con when we come back, we'll continue with this conversation with the director of Ford uh, Foundation, Innocent Chukuma. <laughs> Welcome back. You're still watching One on One here on Plus TV Africa. And my guest for today is Innocent Chukuma, who is the regional director for Ford Foundation. And thank you for still being with us. Um, before we went on that break, you were trying to talk about the relationship between being a virtual activist and being a real activist. And in your position, you think it's better to, uh, there must be a place of merging and synergy uh, mm -hmm. for both ways of activism. Now let's move a bit from activism to your role in Clean Foundation. Of course, we know that you are a passionate advocate for you know, fighting for rights of human persons. What role is Clean Foundation uh, playing in that uh, footstep? Is it still in the same direction that you, we know you, as following? Yeah, I think to answer uh, that question, it's, uh, it's important to give you a little uh, bit of a background uh, about what led to the formation of uh, Clean Foundation, which, by the way, the full name uh, is Center for Law Enforcement Education in Nigeria, which mm -hmm. is where the acronym C-L-E-E-N uh, I came from. So it all started when I was in the CLO. I, um, uh, I was the head of the police research project, which basically monitored abuse of human rights by mm. the police, such as torture, extrajudicial killing, in custody, disappearances, enforced disappearances, and all of that. And uh, because I started work with that, I drew a kind of a excitement whenever I come up with a hard-hitting report and we released it and it was carried on the pages of uh, newspapers uh, with uh, you know, uh, uh, my name being mentioned and, and, and all of that as somebody who was fresh from the university mm -hmm. that uh, you know, all went uh, well. But as I continue to do that type of work, I realized that many of the police officers who were involved in uh, the abuse of human rights that I was monitoring at the time, were not really into it uh, due to sadistic intentions or there's something that they derived by just uh, malhandling fellow human beings. For many of them, it's actually because of the severe lack of capacity for criminal investigation and also the undue uh, pressure that they face from uh, 
from political authorities because the legal uh, framework for police, particularly the Police Act, under Section 9, Subsection 4, vests operational control of the police on the president, which means police will basically do what political authority tells them to do. Whereas in other climes, um, the elected authorities can exercise uh, policy control, but operational control is invested in the chief of police, right. who is a professional to do that work. But because of this legal impediment, police do whatever political authorities tell them to do. Mm -hmm. Police have no capacity to investigate forensic uh, science, even following up on leader. So, and add to that societal pressure on them to deliver right. on results. So sometimes they just get people who are suspected of a crime and tell them to confess mm. or torture them to do that because they want to show result. So it made me realize in the course of this work that we needed to engage them beyond monitoring, reporting, and shaming mm. to find out ways of working with them from the inside to build their capacity to respond to the demands of, uh, of the community. And this also coincided at the time with the UN decades on human rights education. Right. So I organized the first um, conference on law enforcement and human rights uh, uh, in Nigeria, which were held, uh, was organized between the police and the uh, and civil liberties organization. And we came out from that conference by then um, Al Haji Ibrahim Kumasi was the uh, chief of police. Uh, we the communique we talked about other areas of partnering. Mm -hmm. This was in 1995. Uh, later that year, Ken and Eto Daogunis were killed, and CLO was drawn into that uh, struggle. So that made me realize that you couldn't do the kind of work we wanted to do with the police mm -hmm. from within under an advocacy platform. And luckily, the next year, I won the Reebok Human Rights Award, mm -hmm. which came with a prize money of $25,000. And with that, I founded Center for Law Enforcement Education. And the mission was to promote respect for human rights and cooperation between civil society and law enforcement agencies mm -hmm. in the lawful discharge of their duties uh, uh, in Nigeria. Fast forward 22 years after, what is CLEAN doing today? CLEAN is still uh, in that uh, business right. because uh, policing is a continuing act and the challenges we are faced now was different from my time. We're dealing with insurgency, we're dealing with type of crimes that were not there when mm -hmm. we started things like kidnapping, things like bombing, suicide bombing and all of that. We're not there. So they have to change strategies and tactics in order to respond mm -hmm. to the situation we're dealing with today. All right, let's talk about, very quickly, uh, mm -hmm. police brutality, for instance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so did anything change from the time that was? And did you experience so much of what we're seeing? We've had incidences where, you know, the men of the special anti-robbery squad, SARS, mm -hmm. have, you know, tortured citizens, you know, civilians for really no just cause. How do you respond to that? Why are we moving towards that direction where we are now worried that those who are supposed to be taking care of us and protecting us are really the ones who put our lives, you know, in danger in some point? See, sometimes when I sit back and observe what is happening today, I feel there's an irony, it's actually really an irony, that uh, under a democratic dispensation, mm -hmm. uh, the rate of violation of the rights of ordinary suspects, uh, remember earlier I said things have improved for activists uh, and uh, people high up there, but for ordinary suspects, uh, my view, this may be anecdotal, is that things might actually be getting worse for them today compared to the military era. And the question is why? Uh, my answer is that under the military rule, we had draconian decrees like Decree 2, uh, which give police the power to arrest and detain people for a renewable period of uh, six months. They can basically lock you out. Hmm. So they use those powers. And because they had powers under the law to keep you behind bars for as long as they wanted, uh, for many of them, there was really no need to really beat you or suppress hmm. you to uh, confess within today's uh, requirement in mm. the constitution of uh, taking the person to court within 48 hours. So, but today, within 24, 48 hours, they have to show cause why you should not be released. So there's mm. an increased pressure on them to get a uh, result. And added to it, the fact that today, we're dealing more crimes in our crime books than we had uh, in the past. Mm. I was talking of kidnapping, I was talking of uh, insurgency, uh, um, abduction, you know, a suicide bombing, which are all high-level crimes. crimes. And people involved in that are seen by the police to be hardened. So mm. you need to use 
perhaps a little more draconian measures to get them to talk, which is not justifiable under the law, but it's right. actually what the legal framework they're operating Provides. under, the, the unintended consequences of asking them to deliver within 48 hours mm -hmm. without correspondingly equipping them with the modern know-how uh, in mm -hmm. criminal investigation to show the kind of result that we, we want them to produce. All right, uh, thank you so very much, uh, Mr. Chukuma. There. Finally, um, you've been in this business. You've seen different uh, regimes in this country. You've been in the military, you've seen the democratic space. Uh, what do you suggest as the way forward in terms of building capacity for civil organizations, you know, to be able to engage more with our leaders, engage more with the political space, engage more with you know, those who hold powers, so to speak? I think the, 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 the simple thing to say is recite this uh, old age uh, phrase don't agonize, organize. Don't okay. sit back agonizing, things are falling apart. Organize to change those things, get involved. We can't sit back in our houses and think only tweets and Facebook, uh, you know, 240 characters can change or transform Nigeria. They will contribute but by themselves alone. Because I was going cannot... to ask you, are you meaning that that is not working at all? <laughs> They are working, but they need to be complemented with something. Mm -hmm. We need more boots on the ground. You see, in the 21st century, what actually moves leaders is the numbers. Mm -hmm. Look at all the right-wing elements, from religious to sectarian. They are able to put millions on the street. So if you are championing rights and social justice, you need to match them with also putting legs on the So make leaders to understand that you have the numbers. And don't forget we're in a democracy era. Mm -hmm. Numbers are everything. So we really need to engage on the streets. We need to engage on social media. We need to complement and reinforce all these platforms with the clear objective of making the people who are there and sitting pretty that we elected them. They are paid by taxpayers' money. And who pays these tax taxes is we. So they are our employees. Mm. We, didn't, we don't need to treat them with a difference. This is the thing about democracy. It's about likes, electing likes. But in Nigeria, we, re, we elect kings and monarchs. Democracy is not a government of uh, uh, monarchs, mm. as we are seeing in Nigeria. We need to demystify these leaders and treat them like employees that we pay. Guess what you do to an employee that does not work? You want the Send person, and if the person doesn't behave, you sack the person through your ballot. Don't sell it. Mm -hmm. It is our power. All right, thank you so very much. And um, that's where we are going to call it a wrap uh, here on One on One. We've been speaking to Innocent Chukuma, who is the regional director for Ford Foundation. And we do hope that you will stay and catch more of this program here on Plus TV Africa. I am Amaka Okoye. Have yourself a great day. Mm -hmm.